Hey, it's Greg Brown. Grab your logbook, because it's time for another cockpit adventure from the flying carpet. I'm an aviation author, adventure columnist, photographer, former National Flight Instructor of the Year, and Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. The flying carpet is a four-place single-engine light airplane. In it, my wife Jean and I have long traveled the North American continent, searching behind clouds for the real America, and experiencing aerial adventures like today's all along the way. Learn more at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, where you can also see photos from most episodes. And I'd appreciate your feedback in my Flying Carpet Podcast Facebook group. I've got a special story for you today. Some of you may remember meeting my buddy, Baldy Ivy, in Episode 2, Cowboy Pilot, or Episode 28, Cowpunchers Reunion. Well, Baldy and I have been buddies for quite a long time. Well, several years ago, word got out that Baldy had experienced an emergency landing over on the Hopi Reservation, east of Flagstaff, that almost ended in tragedy. And the more the rumors circulated on this, the more eager I was to find out what exactly happened. So I invited my friend Chris Gunn, who is a filmmaker, to join me, and we flew from Flagstaff over to Seligman, where Baldy lives, and we learned this story. Now, one heads up I want to share with you Chris filmed a key clip where Baldy describes what happened in the punchline of this episode. Don't be surprised. As usual, I'll be talking for both Baldy and me through most of the episode, but when we get to the key event, I'm going to let him tell his part of the story directly from this recorded interview. So I hope you'll be okay going back and forth between me speaking for Baldy and Baldy's actual voice, but I think you'll appreciate it when you hear the story. So scramble into the flying carpet, buckle up your seatbelt, and prepare to take off on flying carpet flight number 32, cowboy flying lesson, perils of an off-airport takeoff. Clear prop. <laughs> They're always telling you how to make emergency landings, said my cowboy pilot buddy, Baldy Ivy. But nobody ever tells you how to decide when to take off again. Filmmaker Chris Gunn and I were lunching with Baldy in Seligman, Arizona, on old Route 66. We'd flown from Flagstaff that morning just behind a cold front. It's not easy planning a flight on such a day. While unattended Seligman Airport is just a two-block walk from its namesake town, it's 50 miles from the nearest weather reporting station and lacks an instrument approach. Initially, low-lying cumulus clouds threatened our trip. But after Baldy phoned to report improvement, we'd launched and landed in sparkling clear skies. After perusing Baldy's latest aircraft projects, the three of us convened over lunch at Lilo's West Side Cafe. Frankly, Baldy prefers the nearby Roadkill Cafe. No kidding, the Roadkill Cafe in Seligman. But he knew I love Lilo's Fruit of the Forest Pie, so that's where we went. There, Baldy regaled us with tales of his latest flame, Claudia, a European tattoo and pinup artist. Baldy, I asked, what actually happened on that storied emergency landing you made a few years ago on the Hopi Reservation? I've heard endless rumors about it. I figured you'd asked about that, he replied. I was flying a Cessna 175 over to Taos, New Mexico for my brother's birthday. 
I pre-flighted the airplane and took off at first light. But around Flagstaff, I started noticing what looked like mist on the windshield. I remember thinking it was dust or something, because I had my heater open and hadn't used it for a while. By the time I got to Palaka, 30 minutes or so past Flagstaff over the Hopi Reservation, the mist seemed to be getting worse. I checked the gauges and discovered very low oil pressure, but normal oil temperature. I was thinking, I know there's an airport around here, but I can't find it. I'd better just go ahead and land on the road before the engine seizes. So I landed on the highway and taxied off into this Hopi's yard. It turned out there was oil all over the cowling and engine, and the oil cap was gone. So the mist, what I thought was dust, was actually oil. Then the Hopi tribal police showed up, asking what I wanted to do. Of course, my plan was to fix things and take off again. I explained that I'd lost my oil cap and lost my oil. So I got one of the local Hopis to run me down to the gas station, and I got some car oil. I came back, and I cleaned the windshield and the fuselage. I had three quarts of aviation oil with me and four quarts of car oil that I put in. I still had a quart in the sump, so I ended up with half and half car and aviation oil. Greg, I need to tell you I wasn't an A&P then and didn't know you're not supposed to mix those. Anyway, after topping the sump, I called a friend in Flagstaff and asked if he had a filler cap, which he did not. Not wanting to leave the airplane on the highway overnight, I rolled up a T-shirt and stuck it in the filler tube. Then I cut the lid off a 7-Up can with my pocket knife, safety wired it over the filler tube, and sealed it with duct tape. When the cops asked how much room I needed to take off, I told them off the top of my head, about a half a mile. We paced the highway together, and they set up a barricade about 2,500 feet away to block road traffic. Then I fired up the airplane, taxied onto the highway, did my run-up, and started my takeoff roll. Okay, now we're going to switch over to the clip to let Baldy tell you what happened next. There's another police officer that hears there's an airplane down, and he comes and pulls up ahead of all the traffic that stopped 500 feet ahead of them and is parked on the shoulder in front of a guardrail. So I don't see this. I don't, the fi- they had blocked the road off. They stopped the road 2,500 feet, yeah. So I don't see this until I'm doing about 55 miles an hour in the airplane. It just rotated, and I spot this cop car sitting there, and I thought, I'm going too fast to stop. So I tried to hop the airplane, and I it's, it's real hard to time that. So my left wing came down on top of the running lights on the cop car. Miles. When it did that, it trashed the wing, and there was a bunch of cars parked 500 feet behind him. So I slid the airplane to the right. So I didn't hit any more cars, and that's when I hit the no passing sign. <laughs> Two feet in on the wing of the airplane, so it spun the airplane 90 degrees, and I went down a 10-foot embankment and flipped over. Now, as the airplane was going over, Baldy turned off the engine. I remember the windshield breaking, he said, and thinking this is going to hurt. But after it broke, I thought, well, everything's okay so far. And over on her back, she went. It went real gentle. The airplane was just about stopped because I had my feet on the brakes trying to get stopped. So fortunately, I wasn't hurt. I went to loosen my seatbelt and remembered reading in an article that if you're upside down in a crashed airplane, to put your hands on the ceiling before unbuckling because you're going to fall. So I did that. Then I kicked the door open and climbed out.
Was there an officer in the police car you hit? Asked Chris, astonished. Yep, said Baldy. There was a cop sitting in that cop car when I hit it. Can you imagine how scared that poor guy must have been, seeing the airplane coming? I'm just glad he didn't jump out and get in front of me. Baldy, I said. I'd heard conflicting rumors about the T-shirt and the pop can. Now I can rest easy knowing you used both of them. Yeah, Greg, that's one thing they eventually busted me for. Taken off with illegal equipment. Because a T-shirt and a 7-Up can aren't listed on the airplane's type certificate. If it had been a Dr. Pepper can, I might have been okay. Seriously, though, it's only funny because nobody got hurt. Otherwise, I'd probably be in prison right now. My immediate mistake was telling police I only needed half a mile. I could have said five miles or anything else, and they would have provided it for me. Baldy and I chatted about the likely density altitude that June morning. Baldy reported 5,560 feet elevation on his altimeter before takeoff. Assuming 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the density altitude would have been about 8,500 feet, suggesting that every inch of 2,500 feet would have likely been required for takeoff. While it's true that Baldy's home airport is just 400 feet lower, that runway is 4,800 feet long. So no doubt he cut it close there. The highway was also slightly uphill, added Baldy, and I did not realize that. And although the road was plenty wide enough, I didn't think about the highway signs. I got to be honest with you. I wanted to get out of there and was in a hurry. I didn't take enough time, didn't pay enough attention. The other direction, I would have had five miles and it was downhill. No signs, no viaducts, nothing, man. I headed the wrong way and I don't know why. I think it was because the sun was coming up, Greg. The morning sun was in my eyes going that way, and I think that's what did it, looking back. But afterwards, the FAA safety inspector raised a more important point. The emergency was over when you landed the airplane, he told me. Why didn't you take the wings off and tow it out? or accept a police escort and taxi five miles down the highway to Palaka Airport. Of course he was right. The emergency was over and I created the problem. It never occurred to me that I might have trouble taking off. You're on the ground, the airplane's safe, and everyone's safe at that point. So you need to consider what's the right thing to do next. I didn't take time to properly figure that out. All I could think of was addressing the immediate situation and getting out of there. That led to a number of bad decisions. The cops wanted me out of there safely. They didn't want me to wreck that airplane. They offered to escort me wherever I wanted to go. But you could see 15 miles down the road, so I said, hell no, I can take off right here. The fire department paramedics were great, too. They even gave me a free pen. And no, I never heard from anyone about the lights on the cop car. But sometimes we make poor decisions under the stress of the moment. Ultimately, the feds suspended my pilot certificate for six months for operating the airplane in an unsafe manner without the proper equipment. Driving us to the airport, Baldy told of serving the suspension and reactivating his license through remedial training and an FAA check ride. He then boasted of going on afterward to earn his A&P mechanics certificate. It was a hard lesson, Greg, but I'm a lot better pilot for the experience, he said, as Chris and I boarded the flying carpet. And you can bet I'll be more careful next time I need to land off airport. Anyway, say hi to Miss Jean for me. And adios for now. Many thanks to Baldy for sharing this incredible story with us. And also thanks to Chris Gunn for the recording. Thanks for riding along on today's Flying Carpet Adventure. Please help me continue this podcast by sharing your favorite Flying Carpet episodes on social media 
posting reviews on your favorite podcast directories, and donating via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Thanks in advance for your support. You can find photos from most episodes at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please check out my book of aviation adventure stories, Flying Carpet, The Soul of an Airplane, for which I was named Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. Learn about that and my other aviation books at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. Also at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, you'll find my views from the Flying Carpet Aerial Photography, available in fine art metal prints and pilot achievement plaques. Oh, and I'd appreciate hearing your feedback in my Flying Carpet Podcast Facebook group. Follow my social media sites, most of which can be found by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet, and consider joining my student pilot pep talk group on Facebook. Thanks again for joining me on today's Flying Carpet Cockpit Adventure. Music by Hannes Brown. See you next time.